Well, uh, thank you, Brad, for helping me with my project. I was wondering if maybe you could introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name's Brad Hackett. Um, I'm a Brit living in Mexico. I work for a company called Teachers Latin America, where we recruit teachers for international schools in, you guessed it, Latin America. And I'm also a part-time arts project manager. That's awesome. Um, I had the uh, pleasure of interviewing a uh, person, an elementary school teacher from Monterey uh, earlier in the week. Fantastic. And uh, she was saying her students are really interested in space and she was excited about it and looking for ways to bring more of that into the classroom. Ah, fantastic. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's an interesting time, isn't it? Because, you know, kids have got more time on their hands. So they can kind of go a little bit deeper into subjects that maybe are kind of new for them or they weren't going so deeply into before. So, yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, kind of what uh, led you to get into this final work? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think, um, I don't know, are you a fan of Harry Potter in any sense? I am. I mean, I have two children and we've like have the entire <laughs> collection of books. We've seen every movie. Sure. Uh, okay. So I guess it's kind of, kind of mandatory. Well, I really like the, um, the line that Ollivander, the wand seller says to Harry, where he says, you know, the, the wand chooses the wizard. It's not that the wizard chooses the wand. So I had some kind of some inklings that I wanted to move to Latin America. I was really interested in the politics, really interested in the culture and the language. But really, I, I was working as a teacher. I'd been a, a primary social and natural studies teacher in Spain for about two years. I was doing some kind of um, consultancy work. And I, this just sort of popped up really. Like um, I met someone, a friend of a friend, started talking to me about the company. And um, it sounded like something that was very interesting to me and then um after sending the company about 100 resumes and cover letters finally they added me to the team that's awesome um and yeah. you know that quote i don't remember it from uh harry potter but it's such a long thing but it does remind me of something that jeff bezos says um oh, yeah. he says uh you don't choose your passions your passions choose you Ah, that's an interesting one. Maybe I should start using that one more because that's a little bit more grown up as well. It always really breaks my heart when I ask people, are you a Harry Potter fan? And it has, believe it or not, happened to me that people have said no and they don't know the quote. And I always find that pretty astounding. But yeah, maybe Jeff Bezos is a little bit more of a, a common reference point. Um, so have you ever been to York? Yeah, yeah. York in the UK, not okay. old York rather than New York, I assume. Exactly. Yes, yeah, I've, I actually studied at um, Leeds University, which is, um, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes away from York, something like that. Really beautiful city, town. Yeah, my uh, daytime job, um, the company I work for actually started in York, and oh. I go there about two or three times a year, but the Harry Potter uh, reference and the shambles that they have there, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. York's a great city. I always think like, um, so I'm, I'm from the South of the UK as well, any of your, uh, any of your viewers who are from the UK will clearly be able to tell. Um, and going to university was my first experience in the North. And I think in many ways, it's more of a cultural hub than the South. Like the South gets all of the sort of the press attention and it's more well known because London's in the South, but I really think the North kind of fulfills that sort of like international idea of like what the UK should be like, you know, kind of old worldy village greens, cobbled streets. I think the North is, is the perfect place if you're looking for that. You know, York, Leeds, Manchester. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's awesome. And um, so I guess the first question I'd like to ask people is, uh, did you know that NASA is planning to go back to the moon in 2024, actually send people back to the surface of the moon? I didn't know that. I mean, I had some inkling from the title of the show, but uh, no, I didn't know that. And uh, do you have an idea on approximately the last time we went to the moon? Like, do you think it's like 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60? Like, wow, that's a really good, it's funny, isn't it? You'd think this would be, I suppose, back in 1969 or, you know, the 1969, the first moon landing? The first time, yeah. Yeah, you know, everyone knows that date or everyone maybe should know that date. But yeah, I, I'm not so sure when the last time we was we went was maybe five years ago would be my guess. Would you believe 1972? 1972. Wow. Okay. 
no one has stepped foot on the moon since 1972. And that, that at least at least no human that's been known. No human, yes, that's that's definitely not that that we know of. No, that we know no. Of, yeah. <laughs> sure wow 1972 i mean why it's a good question i mean uh when we first went to the moon um you know we were in that race with the soviet union mm -hmm. and you know the soviet union had um completely uh had so many uh, like first records like the first uh, object orbit the earth the first animal in space the first uh astronaut in space and you know they were just and Absolutely. You know, you had like this Cold War thing going on and people are like, well, they're so much farther than us. And then we had like that whole push. Well, you know, we're going to do better than catch up. We're going to be on the moon first. And so once yeah. you've like built all the political uh, narrative around beating the Russians and you beat them, sure. mm -hmm. it's really hard to do. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. And also, uh, have you heard of the Outer Space Treaty? I haven't heard of the Outer Space Treaty, no. Yeah, it was a treaty that was signed by 100 plus countries before we landed on the moon. And basically, it said that no country can lay claim to another body off of Earth. Uh, so, I mean, if you think back to like Christopher Columbus coming to North America, and he's like, I claim this in the name of Spain. Yes. And so, <laughs> uh, so they wanted to take that aspect out of like the Americans going to the moon and landing a, a flag and saying, now we claim the moon in, in the name of Nixon, sure. I guess would have been there. <laughs> Not just Americans either. Like I'm pretty sure, you know, if they hadn't done that, any country that got there first probably would have at the very least put a flag on a certain part of the moon and said, you know, this is new New York or, you know, something along those kind of lines. Uh, that's right. This is a uh, new to the cube, York. Yeah. <laughs> Or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah, no, I didn't know that, but that's really fascinating. And I think probably a very good thing as well, especially kind of, you know, thinking about maybe where the human race is going in the sort of mid to long term range. You know, I know we're looking more and more towards the moon and kind of, you know, outside of the earth um, for for home. So I guess maybe it's it's a good thing that it's going to be a kind of a neutral space. It can be. I mean, the challenge is um, all of the incentives that, you know, like private parties have to go and explore and develop are kind of removed, you know, I mean, right. Um, you know, it, I mean, used to like in California, when you had like the gold rush, you had people that could go and try to find uh, a place of gold register that and then they would be entitled to some of the money of that claim that then other people would come and and you know develop and and things like that so yeah so it's kind of more more about prestige than anything else i suppose it's just about having kind of like the sticker or you know the imaginary certificate that says we were the first ones to do x y and z yeah and uh, and for people in that state of mind uh you know whenever people say we've been to the moon and we've done that uh now it's time to go be the first ones on mars you know you're sort of in that you know, uh, kind of outer space selfie competition, like who could get a selfie? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. Yeah. Outer space selfie competition. I mean, of course, at some point that probably will become a reality. You know, we're saying these words now and laughing, you know, in a hundred years time when they, well, hopefully in a hundred years time, they won't be digging this up out of a time capsule, but you know, in maybe 300 years time, you know, people will say like, yeah, outer space selfie. I mean, that's, you know, that's just an everyday occurrence. Like, Exactly. Yeah. Um, but you know, it really kind of like that philosophical uh, view of where is humanity going and kind of like how long does humanity last and things like that drives, I think, a lot of the prioritization that we have. I mean, if you think, um, you know, humanity is destined to kill itself in 50 years, you know, why expand out to the rest of the solar system or, right, uh, yeah. you know, um, you know, so I, I'm like kind of curious and uh, from your standpoint, whenever you look at space exploration, um, how does that fit into sort of like your view of the future of humanity? That's a good question. Well, I think like kind of dropping back on, we're taking inspiration from what you said, you know, a lot of the issues that we have as humans, or at least the way I see it, and I'm not, you know, I mean, I did my three separate sciences in the UK, which not everyone does, and I'm still very proud of that. But, um, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I do think 
you know, it doesn't take a scientist to realize so many of our problems are to do with overpopulation. And I'm particularly like, um, so I've, most of the time since I've left, since I immigrated from the UK, I've lived in Mexico City. And Mexico City is a hugely overpopulated city. And it's really interesting that, you know, so we're, I don't know if we're, we're still in Easter weekend or if, uh, well, I guess Easter is over now. In most Latin American countries, it's called um, Semana Santa or Holy Week. And it's almost, it's pretty much as big as Christmas, if not maybe a little bit bigger. And it's really interesting that um, lots of people, this is, is getting to a point, I know it's a bit garbly, lots of people leave Mexico City during Easter week or during Holy Week. And it's amazing that it's, it's like a completely different city. Like you don't realize how actually this transport system in Mexico City is amazing. The job that the government does to do the, to keep the streets clean is amazing. It's just that that city is not designed for the, I think it's something like 23 million people that we have in it. And I think, you know, you can kind of take that microcosm out to the planet. You know, I, I think like it's all very well saying like, yes, you know, we're having issues here and maybe in 50, 50 years time, right? We might really have some major issues. But I think a lot of that is just to do with space and the number of people. So I think if we can spread things out more, then I think, um, I, I think it could, be really positive. I don't think it will solve all of our problems. Like I think, you know, if we if we put everything on that and just say like, yeah, more space, that'll solve it. Obviously, a lot of our problems as humans are are internal. You know, they come from our philosophy, they come from our our mindset. But I think, um, yeah, I don't think it can be a bad thing. I suppose that's my summary. Well, have you been to Tokyo? Talking about large cities. I haven't been to Tokyo. No, although um, my my partner has been to Tokyo a couple of times. I think. Uh, so it, it'd be hard to answer this from personal experience, but what are your impressions of Tokyo talking about like cities? Interesting. Well, I mean, huge technology, um, you know, like very, very advanced in terms of technology. Um, I do know that Tokyo is sort of, again, this is not, like you said, this is not a personal impression. This is more like reported, reported speech, but I think it's a place that should be overcrowded, but kind of isn't. So I was watching a video the other day, obviously, you know, I, I don't know if you heard, there's this thing called coronavirus that everyone's talking about. You know, it's a very hot topic at the moment. What's um, that? No, yeah, kidding. I know, right? <laughs> um, you know, in, um, they were talking about how in, surprisingly, Japan is not doing a great job with coronavirus. Like they, they haven't actually been particularly proactive as a government. But um, they were saying that in all the supermarkets, they're having like a, a one, like a one-way track. So you, to, to keep, you know, a decent amount of space. And I feel like in many ways, Tokyo, Japan at large, you know, they do have quite good systems in place. So it doesn't feel like things are so overcrowded, you know, and people are expected to live in smaller apartments. So, you know, if, if, if all of us, you know, I don't live in a particularly large apartment, but I'm sure I could live in a smaller one. If we all lived in slightly small, if we economized on space, we could probably have, you know, a lot more room for, nature, trees, things that offset carbon dioxide. So I guess that, that's my impression of Tokyo vis-a-vis -vis overcrowding. Yeah. Um, so I've been to Tokyo right? a couple yeah. of, I have been to Tokyo a couple of times. Uh, Tokyo, um, yeah. And I've also been to Mumbai uh, because a couple wow. of times too. And just like okay. looking at the two experiences, um, mm -hmm. I think they're roughly about the same number of people between the two. But you go to Mumbai and you really feel the presence of all the millions of people around you. And it feels dusty and dirty and chaotic mm -hmm. and all of that. And you go to Tokyo and it's like clean and there's lots of people, but they're like organized and, sure. you know, and it le led me to the thought uh, that maybe it isn't as much overpopulation as under organization. I was just wondering mm -hmm. what your sort of response to that might be. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's not the experience that I've, you know, with the little sort of metaphor that I explained in, in Mexico city, that hasn't been my experience. Like I feel maybe it's a little bit of both, you know, like it's not really 100% one. It's not really 100% the other. Like it's definitely, you know, having more people in a small amount of space, 
creates more problems, but that doesn't mean that you need to kind of like put your hands up in the air and say like, ah, let's just give up. Let's just let it be mayhem and chaos. Not that I'm saying that Mexico city is mayhem and, and chaos in a bad way. It's, it's a lovely kind of mayhem and chaos, but, um, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it's, it's, it's a little bit of, of both, but I think, you know, in many ways the the Japanese have such a reputation for being able to do some things incredibly well. You know, I think there is very much this kind of, um, this ethos of, you know, where is some of the best food in the world? Japan. And I don't think that has so much to do with sort of the, the agriculture in Japan as it does with, you know, a lot of the times when Japanese people are going to put their minds to something, they do it incredibly, incredibly well. Um, so I think maybe there is a, a cultural aspect there, but, um, again, I'm going out of my own field and sort of throwing some generalizations out there, seeing what sticks. Yeah, no, that sounds, yeah, that sounds good. Um, but coming back to like, um, space being a way to, uh, you know, maybe expand out in terms of population. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a whole nother area of, uh, the earth that has been kind of, um, completely uh, ignored in terms of expanding out. And that's the oceans. I mean, if you look at the Pacific Ocean, it takes mm -hmm. up half the globe. I mean, you could literally turn the globe and not see any land, you know, if you yeah. land it just right. Absolutely. And, you know, you could build like floating cities and underwater cities and things like that. Yeah. And I mean, I think as well, you know, at least in the short term, that would be hugely popular as well, wouldn't it? Because, you know, we, you know, people love cruise ships, people love islands, people, you know, and it's really good for us on a psychological level to have water around us. I think that's kind of like a, an anthropological thing that comes back from cavemen times, you know, you see water and you know that means life. So, you know, that it makes you feel good to see water and trees because that's in our brains that equals sustenance. So I think in terms of popularity, that would be a, a, a huge hit in terms of practicality i guess that's really the question isn't it how practical is it to have floating cities and to have um was the other one you said you said floating cities uh, and, and an underwater cities underwater, yeah. underwater cities even like kind of next i feel like in many ways the infrastructure needed for an underwater city might contribute to the breakdown of the environment in a in a more considerable way i don't know what do you think do you think underwater cities could be feasible um i i don't know but i mean if it seems to me from, i love it i mean if it's if it's gonna happen sign me up by all means like uh it just seems to me from um like a near-term practicality standpoint mm -hmm. uh you we already know how to build things on the earth you know and we know how to build like vessels and you i mean you and i could go out and get in a canoe and literally paddle mm -hmm. you know we don't have to create like a big rocket ship and we don't have to worry about not having air yeah, that's, uh, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, you, you have that. And, and maybe that's a good um, kind of a bridge point. You know, once you figure out how to build uh, cities in the ocean that are self-contained, now you can go and say, well, I could build self-contained cities in more hostile places. And you could kind of work yourself out to uh, building more and more yeah. resilient cities. Definitely. Yeah, you're right, aren't you? Because I mean, you know, we, we're so focused, or maybe not so focused, but you know, it, it's a race, isn't it? It's a race to the moon. It's a race to build these cities. And you know, once we get there, we actually have to build them. You know, like, and I suppose that's the thing Like, do we, maybe we have the technology to be able to get, you know, huge pieces of infrastructure out there, which I, I think is realistic. But you know, do we have the technology to build a space that's not only livable but actually you know we don't just want to survive we want to thrive you know like is it going to be like like wally -E where it's all you know the pixar film where it's there's no plants you know it's very kind of like technological and it's again yeah i feel like we we need water and we need plants to feel healthy mentally mm -hmm. so i suppose that's uh yeah that's a, i've never thought about it that way that's fascinating um now you know the first time I went to the moon there were three billion people on earth and now there's more than 7 billion, I think. Um, yeah. So, and- I, mean, I haven't counted, but yes. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, still working on it. Census is this year in the US, so. <laughs> yeah. um, I, and, you know, each one of those people have a brain and that brain can solve problems. Mm -hmm. Now, theoretically, um, 
we should be having more problems solved with each person that kind of gets born and comes alive and stuff. But it seems to me that much of humanity's mental capabilities aren't actually directed towards problems that improve life. And I was wondering if that's been your experience through the work that you do. And then like, what do you think would be like a key enabler to sort of change that? So, um, sorry, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna need you to summarize that for me because that was a big concept. So you're saying <laughs> that um, like the way, let me see if I got this right. As humans, a lot of our, a lot of our thinking is focused on kind of like short term solutions, whereas you're more going for longer term ones. What was the distinction you made? Like, you know, uh, well, um, maybe not even towards a long or sh- uh, short or long term, but um, you know, either it's uh, a lot of energy spent convincing people of something, or yeah. arguing against people, or trying to figure out, you know, like, um, I mean, uh, you know. Uh, things that don't actually contribute to an improvement in their lives are necessary society. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think I follow you. Wow. I think that takes us to a really sort of interesting sort of political side of the, I mean, I suppose, you know, ev- everything is political. The personal is, is political, but I think, um, in, in my work, I mean, um, I work in, in HR, you know, we, are, I do recruitment for international schools and I'm, also like I said a project manager so that's a lot of um in those scenarios you to some extent we are out we're outsourcing for companies or we're outsourcing for institutions or charities so we're often the outsider um but and I really have to step carefully here because I don't want to sound sort of presumptuous or arrogant but I know about human resources more than someone who doesn't work in human resources and I think there's often a disconnect when you're an outsider coming into an organization and providing a service that, you know, obviously the the school or the charity or the company knows very well what they want, but they're not an expert in what they do. So I feel that there's often a, a mixing of, you know, if, if every school that I work with, if every charity that I work with did exactly what I said, then I think, you know, we would save ourselves a lot of problems. Not because, you know, I, I'm the best human resources manager in the world, but just because you know, I've been, I've had more experiences of things going wrong than they have, you know, and that's life, isn't it? It's kind of making those, those mistakes and getting that. But I think um, there is a tendency in sort of in, in every career or in every industry to kind of think that way. Like I know best, why don't people just do what I say? And I think that kind of almost takes us in a slippery slope towards kind of like uh, totalitarian regimes. Um, and I think that's another interesting one for me, you know, having lived in, in Latin America for the last four or five years, um, I've never heard dictators venerated so much. Um, oh, really? Yeah, which is a really interesting thing for me. I mean, obviously, you know, in the UK where I'm from, we've never had, I mean, we had monarchs and I guess monarchs are also dictators, but sort of in, in the modern age, we haven't had a dictator. At least that's my personal belief. And maybe, you know, I'm going to get some some flack for that. But I think, um, you know, when I lived in Spain, okay, not Latin America, but um, Spanish speaking world, a lot of people were really into Franco and Franco was a dictator. The same thing um, here in Mexico, Porfirio Diaz was the guy who started the Mexican revolution in many in my opinion an awful dictator so you know if you think of the dictatorship in brazil but often you will meet people from these countries who say like yes they were awful dictators but they got the company the, they got the country back on track economically or they got the country back on track um sort of in terms of of infrastructure in terms of um justice whatever it might be and i think when i first arrived to these countries and i heard people saying things like this it really sort of blew my mind and i was really shocked and i think the more time that i spend in countries that have had a dictatorship you sort of realize it's not it's not so black and white you know it's not really a pass fail thing like good you know good government bad government it's more it's more gray you know even when someone does something really awful there's normally something you can find within their policies that actually did some good so yeah like i say i knew we were going to get into some kind of rabbit hole there but i don't know do you do you sort of um see where i'm coming from yeah completely completely Mm -hmm. um and you know it kind of touches on another point i i talked to somebody in pakistan earlier this um week that's been really um kind of 
talking on how to improve his country. Mm-hmm. And he says that one thought uh, that he keeps wrestling with is people expect for the government to solve all problems. And right. that, um, you know, he's trying to encourage entrepreneurship and people to, mm-hmm. uh, people with common interests to bond together and uh, go and tackle these problems. And sure. I was wondering if that also uh, seems to resonate with you in terms of, um, it seems like people who like dictators really want that powerful entity, that benevolent, powerful entity to come right. and solve things. Yes, I think that's the phrase. And then the benevolent dictator, no one wants a, a bad dictator, but I just feel like, you know, one man's or one person's benevolent dictator is another person's dictator, dictator, non-benevolent dictator. Yeah, um, that's such a big and interesting question. I think... Um, so obviously I come from the UK um, and I think it's particularly, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in sort of international environments now. I've lived in Kenya, I've lived in Spain, I've lived in Mexico. And um, I spend a lot of time with Americans because, you know, uh, any country you go to, you will meet an American. It's very likely. And it's really interesting. I think, you know, see, even though we are, you know, cousins across the pond, it's interesting that there is this big divide when it comes to exactly that that idea of, um, you know, should, is it about entrepreneurship? Is it about, um, you know, people being self-starters and kind of creating something for themselves? Or is it about a government providing that framework and providing that safety net? And I think the UK is obviously far, far more over to the side of welfare and health support. And I think coming from that context, coming from that framework, it's almost impossible for me to kind of see a a scenario where that's not the case. But I think a lot of that is to do with the, the environment, you know, sociologically speaking that I grew up in. So I think um, I see the, I think it's a bit of, you know, like it's, it's carrot and stick at the same time, you know, like you, you should incentivize people to be entrepreneurs. Sure. And, you know, it's, it's great if people can get together and form cooperatives and obviously wherever a government fails, often it's the case that a charity picks up the work that it's not doing. You know, I used to work for um, a charity for adults with learning difficulties. That charity only existed because, you know, there were adults in the community with learning difficulties who felt like their needs weren't being met by the government. So I do think it's in human nature to try and kind of plug up the, the holes in the sinking boat. But I think, you know, I probably lean more towards the side that, you know, the government should support, there should be, there should be the opportunity for people to fail and that not to mean that their life is ruined. And I don't personally think that's that controversial to say, but I think, um, you know, there are, there are many different views under the sun on this subject, I suppose. Yeah, no, I think you're hundred percent right. And I would imagine like 99% people would agree with you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other part of that is that people should be encouraged to try uh, and maybe that's not happening so much. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I, and I mean, you know, I, I, I think I do have seen both sides, but, you know, there is the, obviously things are, you know, now we're in a completely different sort of world order, at least for the next sort of six months to some extent, you know, loads of countries that never really used to have a sort of a concrete welfare system are now doing universal credit and things like that. So it's, who knows how that will change in the future, but, you know, talking about the past, which is the only concrete thing we really have to talk about. Um, you know, I have seen abuses of the welfare system in the UK and that's unfortunate. But again, I think my, I, I'd have to lean more towards the sort of somewhat left wing or liberal side and say that, you know, I'd rather see a system being abused, um, but everyone who needs it gets what they need than a system which is too stringent um, and, yeah, a system where people are, you know, sort of forced too much on the on the other side, if if that makes sense. It does. And yes. last question: um, If sure. it was safe and affordable, would you have an interest in going in space? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's honestly, it's not my top priority. I do remember when I was younger, I wanted to visit all. Is it 192 countries in the world, if you include Taiwan? And it was it, one of the UN like figures a little while. It was 192. It's right around 200. I know that. So. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I think when I was younger, I used to say to myself, right, 
I'm going to visit every country in the world. That's going to be something I do before I die. Now that I'm a little bit older and perhaps a little bit more realistic, I'm thinking maybe I could just visit every country in Latin America. That would that in itself would be something. So I think that's a, a, a greater priority for me at the moment. But um, so yeah, I, you know, I would really like to to fully or as fully as I can get to know this planet first in terms of you know going to going to another going to another planet going to the moon going to space in some way i think yes yeah you know it's definitely something that would excite me and i think the you know the excitement and the newness of it outweighs any potential risks i mean that's generally my philosophy in life anyway but um yeah i, I think i probably would it's just not the the world first and the moon second i think that seems fair um <laughs> Any uh, words in closing you'd like to share? No, I would thank you so much, Nathan, for your time. This was really, really enjoyable. Um, if anyone else is watching and they're kind of, you know, considering coming on and speaking to you, like um, such an eye opener, so much to think about. This is a really wonderful project and all the very best of luck with it. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure.